today. Up next, the topic turns to Israeli foreign policy in another Live You Will Call In program. We'll talk with Rabbi Meir Kahana of Kof International and Jerome Seal of the Jewish Peace Lobby. Jerome Siegel, president of the Jewish Peace Lobby. In your opinion, what's the state of democracy in Israel today? Well, our real concern with democracy in Israel has to do with the future of democracy in Israel. Uh, as you know, Israel uh, today occupies the West Bank and Gaza, which includes 1.7 million Palestinians uh, who are not uh, Israeli citizens but have lived for over 20 years under Israeli control. And the, uh, the issue is one, of course, is the, the absence of their ability to determine their own lives now. But uh, more than that, it's a question of their future. Uh, if Israel isn't to forever to uh, be an occupying power, it has only uh, two options, one of which is to uh, free the Palestinians, allow them to govern themselves in their own society, or to, uh, to annex uh, the West Bank and incorporate the territories and the people. But if it does that, if it remains a democracy, it'll soon cease to be a Jewish state. So it'll be driven, I believe, to retain its Jewishness unless it gets rid of the territories to abandon its dem democratic character. Let me ask the same question to the man across the table to you, Rabbi Meir Kahana, chairman of the Chach Movement and also a former member of the Knesset. What is the state in your judgment of democracy in Israel today? Well, first of all, I think that uh, every time I hear some Jewish liberal talking about the lack of democracy inside Israel, for the Arabs. I'm amazed that I never heard Dr. Siegel's voice raised when the state of Israel banned my Kach movement, a thing which, of course, could never happen in this country. But getting back to what uh, was said, I think that Dr. Siegel perhaps raised a very, very basic issue which he himself doesn't really, really grasp. He speaks about the fact that if Israel would, were to annex the uh, uh, territories, they would be faced with a problem of uh, demography versus, de versus democracy, meaning that there might be too that that there might be too many Arabs. I wonder if Dr. Siegel has ever thought about the fact that giving up what he calls the occupied lands, which I call, of course, the liberated lands, would not the same problem remain in 20 or 30 years if the demographic situation within the state of Israel would be that of many, many Arab babies and very, very few Jewish babies. And would Professor Siegel state that the Arabs have a right to peacefully be a majority within the state of Israel? Does he not recognize that there is a basic contradiction between Zionism per se and Western democracy? Before anybody responds, let me get each of you to talk a little bit about your association. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Siegel, what is the Jewish Peace Lobby and what is its goal? Okay. The Jewish Peace Lobby is a, an American organization composed of American Jews. Uh, our concern is, as Americans, with American foreign policy insofar as it bears on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're an organization that is concerned about Israel's security, but basically believes that Israel's security can best be um, satisfied by ultimately a settlement which exchanges land for peace and uh, respects a Palestinian right 
the self-determination. So How is the Jewish peace lobby funded? We're funded uh, entirely by uh, small contributions uh, from our, our members, uh, all of whom are Jewish. Rabbi Kahana, what is the Kach movement? The Kach movement, unlike the Jewish peace movement, is a thing that is derived from Israel. We live in Israel. We don't have the luxury of living in uh, Baltimore and talking about giving up, giving up and gambling, giving up the land for uh, peace, and if we should lose that gamble, we will suffer and not people in uh, uh, Baltimore. The Kach movement is a movement which states that the land of Israel is ours. The Arabs had an opportunity in 1947 to have their Palestinian state. They turned it down. They went to war. They killed 6,000 6, Jews in 1948. They were killing Jews in the 1920s and 1930s when clearly the, the issue was not the occupied lands in 1967. And uh, we get our funding also in a very small way. And it is a political party. Oh, yes, it is. In fact, uh, we won a seat in the Knesset in 1980, 80, 84. In 88, the poll showed us getting, it had a large number of uh, seats until I was banned. Let me tell our audience that the phone lines are open, and you can begin dialing the phone as you think about what you'd have to say or ask our guests. The phone numbers are on the bottom of your screen. If you're calling from the Eastern or the Central time zones, you can dial area code 202-628-2525. And if you're calling from the Mountain or Pacific time zones, it's 202-783-2727. And we'll go to the phones after we hear a little bit more from our guests. And I guess uh, we'll ask Mr. Siegel, uh, what would you say to Mayor Kahana's opening remarks? Let me, actually, I wanted to, to actually say a little bit more about the perspective of our, of our organization. Okay. Uh, where we think we are in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now is with uh, a rare moment, which uh, I don't believe is going to last forever. But um, as probably many people remember, uh, a little bit over 40 years ago, when the United Nations attempted to resolve the conflict through the idea of partition, creating a, uh, a Jewish state and an Arab state, in November of 1947, what happened is that the Arab countries got up and walked out of the General Assembly, and they denounced this partition resolution as null and void. Some 20 years later, after the 67 war, when the UN Security Council passed Resolution 242, which basically laid out a framework of exchanging land for peace as a basis for a settlement, the PLO, uh, at that point, uh, denounced Resolution 242 as involving uh, implicit recognition of Israel. And it's basically been the refusal to accept a Jewish state in the Middle East that has been uh, at the heart of the conflict for the last 40 years. In the last year, a last year and a half, but basically in November of 88, a long-term evolution, both in Arab thinking and in Palestinian thinking, came to a head when the PLO formally reversed uh, positions on this issue, both with respect to the original idea of partition, and then it accepted Resolution 242, and it met basically the American conditions. My own belief is that for the first time, uh, there's a possibility, and it's only a possibility, and, and, and it may not be a great one, but there's a possibility of resolving the conflict. And our belief is that um, what Israel should do is to, uh, to sit down with the Palestinian representatives, and we believe that an open election on that would demonstrate that it is the PLO, to sit down with them on the basis of a, uh, a land for peace formula as is in Resolution 242 and negotiate directly with them. And uh, our focus is on American policy, which we don't think America, the American government can force Israel uh, to leave the territories or to negotiate with the PLO, and we don't think it should try to force them. But we do think that America can play a constructive role in, uh, in moving towards a conflict, and that's really what our organization is, is about. Rabbi Kahana, before the next, for the first call, let me ask you, uh, and I'll ask you too, Jerome Single, what do you think of uh, Senator Dole's proposal that foreign aid that is delivered to Israel be cut back in favor of foreign aid to countries in Eastern Europe? Well, uh, I would first like to, you know, perhaps, perhaps answer that rather, rather long, uh, 
long answer of uh, Mr. Siegel. I think that Mr. Siegel has a great, great problem in that he has great contempt for the Arabs. The Arabs are not interested in recognizing in Israel. The Arabs were not anti-Israel in 1948. They were anti-Israel in 1920. In 1929, they massacred 67 Jews in one day in Hebron. In any case, I think that the uh, question of did Arafat change? I think that Arafat looks at people like Dr. Like Dr. Siegel and should be given the Nobel Prize for not laughing. He uses Dr. Dr. Siegel. He doesn't accept to, for, to accept within the context, as he said, of all the other all the other resolutions of the UN, including 187 of 1947. They don't they don't they don't recognize Israel having been been beaten in four wars. They now realize that they have no choice but to use Jews such as Dr. Siegel, who will be some, someday, God forbid, the Herzl of uh, Palestine, uh, and that's it. Now, as far as, uh, as your, your question about... Tell you what, why don't we defer that, because my questions are less important than those of our callers. And the first one is a patient caller from Dayton, Ohio. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Uh, hello? You're on the air, sir. Hello? You're on the air, sir. Yes, the, the, the current state is a state of Israel. There are the occupied territories. There is the Golan Heights. There is Lebanon below the Latani River. My question to, Dr. to Rabbi Kahani is, do you believe whether that is the limit of Israel's territory, or do you believe that there is more that Israel is entitled to in the way of territory? I mean, uh, Eretz Israel. Sir, I'm a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, a Bible believer. There is no question that the uh, boundaries of Israel are those stated within the Bible. God, God's uh, boundaries. Having said that, I am not prepared to start a war for anything which is in Arab hands, the occupied lands which the Arabs have, which are really ours. We would have accepted the boundaries of 1947 had the Arabs done so. We would have accepted the uh, boundaries of one day before the 1967 war had they done so. I accept the boundaries that we have now. But once they start a war and they kill our soldiers and we win that war, that land is ours. And let them learn a lesson that winners win and losers lose. And that should be one that Dr. Siegel should also learn. Dr. Siegel? Now, first of all, let me... Let me respond to the, the, the statement that was made about uh, uh, believing Arafat or trusting Arafat or I'm, am I a dupe of Arafat's or, or whatever. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, I don't have any uh, access into uh, uh, Yasser Arafat's inner mind. Uh, I have never maintained that, uh, that Israel or anybody else should either trust Arafat, nor do I think that any country should make its national security decisions on the basis of trust. Uh, I think that the, the, the bottom line basis of Israeli security uh, has been and is going to continue to be in the foreseeable future the strength of the Israeli army. It's the IDF. What I'm saying is that uh, Israel is a strong and powerful country uh, the Palestinians, for the first time in the conflict, are now saying that they want to resolve the conflict. For the first time in the conflict, they're saying that they are prepared to sit down with the Israelis and negotiate it. And what I'm saying is that Israel is strong enough and peace is enough in its interest that it should go ahead and do it. It doesn't have to worry about uh, the possibility of those negotiations. The Israelis are no cream puffs. If they get into those negotiations, they will not leave those negotiations unless they get the kind of agreement uh, that they want and they think will satisfy their national security needs. And if it requires Arafat to say um, for the PLO or for the entire PLO to revoke the covenant, to say that the conflict is over now and forever, to recognize Israel's legitimacy and the claim, if it requires special security guarantees and so on, whatever it requires, Israel is going to negotiate. Four. And I am not uh, 
trying to restrict the Israeli negotiating position at all. I'm just saying don't be afraid to negotiate. There's an opportunity here. We have half an hour left with our guests. The next call for them is from Houston, Texas. Go ahead, please. Uh, my thoughts were kind of directly in line with what this man was just saying. And uh, to Mayor Kahana, uh, he's making moral judgments on this man. Uh, because he is a so-called liberal. But how long uh, has Israel been practicing destabilization as they do in Lebanon? And all of the problems in the surrounding area, if Palestine had a state that they were promised in 1947, and they're just now, you know, willing or able to have leaders to come forth, uh, don't you think that uh, creating a Palestinian state will ease the pressure in Lebanon and uh, some of the other places? No, I don't. No, I don't. I think that Israel or Palestine or Jordan or, or Iraq have absolutely no bearing upon uh, Lebanon. The only lesson that we can learn from Lebanon is that all those people who speak about coexistence between Jews and Arabs should look at Lebanon where Arabs can't even live with each other. I'm always impressed, in fact daily so, by what happens in Beirut. Uh, Sunnis and Shiites and Druze and Christians and Hezbollah and Amal massacre each other. What you see happening in Lebanon is what would happen to us, God forbid, if we were so foolish as to listen to Arafat or to people such as Dr. Siegel. Dr. Siegel, any comment on that before we take the next call? Yeah. I think, I think the, um, the interesting place to look in terms of the um, possibilities of resolving the conflict is in fact to uh, what uh, Prime Minister Begin agreed to, which was the land for peace deal in terms of making peace with Egypt. Uh, he gave back the Sinai. He got in exchange for it uh, recognition and a, uh, and a peace treaty with Egypt. Um, that treaty has now lasted for over 10 years, despite the fact that many people said that uh, he was giving up uh, land for uh, something that was very ephemeral, a piece of paper that could be torn up uh, the next day. And that basically is the pillar of Israeli national security, which is to have divided Israel's major uh, significant military enemies, Egypt and Syria. And the real question in terms of Israel's longer term security is whether or not the peace treaty with Egypt can be preserved, deepened, and ultimately uh, expanded to a larger set of Arab countries. It's never been the Palestinians themselves which have constituted, for all the terrorism that there was, it never constituted an actual threat to overrunning Israel or destroying Israel's existence. But the Arab armies of legitimate major Arab states have. And the question is, how is that going to be affected by resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or keeping it open-ended? I believe that resolution is the key to uh, stabilizing the treaty with Egypt and expanding it to other Arab states. Toronto, Ontario, go ahead. Uh, hello? Hello, you're on the air. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, if you get to um, an overall settlement with the Arabs and the occupied territories, um, how that would affect or how Israel could also get to the bargaining table some of the countries that may not want such a peace to exist, and that gets to the security question. Let's say, uh, you know, the question of countries like Syria, Iraq, uh, Georgia Tech, NC State. Uh, in the end, um, how can you make security arrangements? All right, thank you. Dr. Siegel. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it depends on which countries we're talking about. It's a very uh, different situation. I believe that in the wake of the uh, Iran-Iraq war and Syrian support for Iran in that war, there is a possibility. Uh, it's a slim possibility, but it's one thing that I'd like to see and our organization would like to see American foreign policy exploring, which would be the possibility of moving forward in ending Israel's state of war with Iraq. And uh, Syria is a very different problem. Uh, it's never been fully clear to me whether Syria is uh, objectives are uh, t are to regain the uh, the Golan Heights, or uh, uh, or a good as its minimal objectives, or or rather whether or not Syria has got uh, an internal need to maintain itself in a state of war with Israel. I don't have a magic formula for uh, for bringing Syria 
to the negotiating table, though I think that the possibility of Syria being completely isolated in the Arab world, which would be something that would tend to happen if Israel was able to make peace with the Palestinians, would be something that would motivate Syria in that direction. Uh, whether or not uh, that could be worked out, I don't know. But from an Israeli national security point of view, Syria, which is isolated, is a very different uh, commodity in terms of a threat than a Syria that is, uh, is realigned with a, uh, an Arab world that is uh, once again committed to destroying Israel. So the question of whether or not Syria and Egypt ever come back together is critical. Rabbi Kahana. I think it's an incredible thing to, to you know, listen to someone talking about what Arab states will be, will be doing. If ever there was an area, a region in the world in which it is impossible to know what will be tomorrow, it's the Middle East. I would not, if I were an insurance agent, I would not write a policy for the president of Egypt. It's incredible to hear Dr. Siegel speaking about the Camp, the Camp David Accord with Egypt and peace on the very day of the attack inside Egypt on a bus in which 10 Jews were murdered. Uh, there have been 10 years of peace now. There have been 10 years of no war. Let me tell you that between 1956 and 1967, there were 11 years of no war with an Egypt led by Nasser. Egypt will go to war when it is convinced that it can win. Egypt will not go to war, as Syria doesn't go to war, not because it likes Israel, but because it knows it cannot win. If you want to speak about, about peace, don't tell me there's a slim chance, a slim possibility. I am not going to risk my life, and I live there and that of my children and grandchildren on your slim, slim hopes. If the Palestinians want a state, let them, let them set it up inside Jordan. And that will be peace. Now you know that, 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 the, that the chance of that happening are as slim or not as slim as the uh, uh, chances of their, of their accepting anything short uh, for the time being, the entire West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza. And if you believe that there is one person in the government of Israel, whether labor or Likud, who would ever accept that, then you don't know labor or Likud. You're talking about things that are, are, that are uh, pipe dreams, castles in Spain, things that, are, things that are so lacking in anything that is relevant, meaningful, and above all, get one thing clear, every Arab state, every Muslim state is convinced that Israel is a bandit state. It has no right to be there. In Islam, any, any land which was once under Islam is Islam, and it must be taken back again. Why this contempt for Arabs and for Islam? I understand them. And because of that, and with terrible, terrible pain, I say that there will not be peace there. And I want peace a great deal more than you want peace. I live there. Fresno, California. Go ahead. How you doing? I just want to say, first of all, um, after watching on a satellite some BBC reporting on the uh, occupied uh, territories about how the, about five months ago, I saw Orthodox Jewish settlers with automatic weapons um, step, uh, stopping cars and beating up fellow Israelis that went to give food and aid, number one. Um, I saw how they treat it uh, on the BBC uh, report. I mean, it's totally different than the American, how we look at it. Now, I just want to ask this guy right here. You know, technology is advancing so quickly. And if you don't make a deal, I tell you, in another 15 years, it's not going to be that much time that... Uh, that the you know atomic bomb could be made in in a backyard, and these people, if you don't make a deal, <laughs> they'll do it. And that's all I want to say. And you guys have a good day. All right, thank you. I think that well, last I, comment was addressed to you, Rabbi Kahana. Yeah, prob probably so. I guess I was that you know guy. Uh, I think I think that that this man's logic is overwhelming. 
If it's true, and unfortunately it is true, that in 15 years and perhaps in uh, five years, they'll have nuclear weapons, what in the world, why should they want to make a deal now? And what would, be, and what would their, their word be worth in 15 years when they have those, those uh, weapons? We know exactly what the you know, problem is. The problem is exactly that which Dr. Siegel says it is not. It is a question of trust. We don't trust them. We don't believe them. They are people who, there is not one Arab in the PLO who can sit down at a table, write a treaty, sign it, guarantee it. It is rooted with factions. There is the Arafat faction, the Hawatma faction, the George Habash faction, and God knows how many other factions, not to, not to mention Hamas the, uh, of uh, uh, Islam. So there, there is a problem of nuclear weapons, a problem of, of chemical weapons. There is a problem of Iraq, whom for some incredible reason Dr. 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 Siegel sees a, a slim chance of, uh, sitting, of sitting down with. Uh, of all the Arab states, Iraq is the one state which didn't even sign an armistice accord with Israel, I mean, let alone a peace treaty. It has, it has missiles. It has gained tremendously from, the, from its, uh, its war with Iran. It is probably the most dangerous of the Arab states. Why should they make peace with us if, if in, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, they'll have the nuclear weapons and the missiles? I don't trust them, I don't believe them, and the, the tragedy is that Dr. Siegel does not realize that the Middle East is not the Middle West. Rabbi, let's give Dr. Siegel a chance to respond because we do have a okay. caller from there France were, on hold. There are about four uh, points lurking, or, lurking around here. First of all, on the issue that the caller raised about, about nuclear weapons or nuclear chemical uh, exchanges, I think what is relevant about it is that it tells us something, uh, as the Iran-Iraq war did, about what future wars uh, in the Middle East could look like. Uh, my own belief is that if there is a future war between Israel and the Arab states, it's not going to be a, uh, a six-day miracle. It will be something that will resemble the Iran-Iraq war, and it's something sooner or later in which uh, the countries may be driven to use of either nuclear or nuclear chemical exchanges. So the stakes are very high. They're very high for both, for both sides. Um, one reason why countries make peace is because of their own self-interest. And I think that, um, that what we may find ourselves in, in the Middle East uh, in the not too distant future is a deterrence regime, something that we have between the United States and the Soviet Union. What we're discovering today in U.S.-Soviet relations is the fact that, um, that even with nuclear rep weapons, you can move towards much greater likelihood of peace by getting at some of the fundamentals of the, of the antagonism. Now, one of the things that, uh, that was mentioned is uh, Islam and the uh, treating of Islam as if it's much of a muchness and Arabs as if they're much of a muchness and if somehow it's an inherent characteristic in it, irreconcilable hostility to Israel and so on. Actually, there's a great deal of, there's a great deal of diversity. Um, the, uh, in the Palestinian world, Today, there is um, a growing uh, Islamic fundamentalist movement uh, uh, represented in part by Hamas, which is strong in Gaza. Uh, Hamas rejects the very moves that the PLO has made. Uh, it objects to the two-state solution, which the PLO accepts. It rejects uh, the PLO's acceptance of Resolution 242 and the basic idea of partition. If, in fact, Israel does not make a peace with the Palestinians, and I mean the Palestinians that are represented either by the PLO or people who support the PLO, what will happen, as, we, as we're seeing, um, is that, in fact, uh, hardliners, Islamic fundamentalists who are hardliners on the question of Israel, will increasingly come to dominate uh, decision-making, and uh, peace will probably become impossible. If peace becomes impossible in a world that's heading towards uh, mutual nuclear capabilities, we're moving towards a situation in which Israel will be far less secure than it is today. And if, uh, if Rabbi Kahana is, uh, is really 
uh, concerned about Israeli security and tracks through on this, I doubt very much that he would want to find Israel in a situation in which, in fact, there are two nuclear buttons, uh, one held by Israel and one held by uh, a, an Arab state which is at, in a state of war with Israel. We've got less than a quarter hour to go, and we've got to go to this next caller, this one from Khan, France. Go ahead, please. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, this question is for Mr. Kahani and about Lebanon, where he mentioned all these factions are fighting in Lebanon. Every single faction that he mentioned was somehow helped by Israel with arms or money. And for one reason or another, they helped every faction there up to date. Is that a self-fulfilling prophecy to help create the problem in Lebanon? So Israel can take the stand that if Arabs can't live in peace, how can we live in peace with them? And why is Israel such a peace-loving country? Is always involved with people like a Noriega and a Colombia, etc., etc., South Africa, you name it. <coughs> All right, sir. Thank you. Con France. And I think that, uh, first of all, it's simply not, not true that Israel helped all those, all those factions. Uh, in the Lebanese war, Israel did help the uh, 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 Christians. It's true. That was called self-interest. It's a kind of self-interest that every, that every country follows. It's certainly, Israel certainly has not helped Amal. Hezbollah, the Shiites, it's absurd. The, uh, the Lebanese problem is a problem which has nothing at all to do with Israel. It is a problem of Arabs who simply cannot live with each other. And that is something which has not gone away and will not go away. Uh, in the Arab world, yesterday's enemy is today's friend. And then, of course, tomorrow, who knows what. Egypt and Syria are now getting closer. They will undoubtedly establish ties, uh, ties formally soon. Does that mean that they're really friends? No, of course not. Syria and Jordan were bitter enemies and then suddenly friends. And uh, The Arab world is a world that is volatile. And one, cannot sim one simply cannot trust the paper that any agreement is, would be, would be writ written on. As far as uh, Israel backing, uh, backing various uh, countries, I put it to you that countries back countries out of self-interest. This country does it. The Soviet Union does it. Great Britain does it. All countries do it. Thank God that countries follow self-interest. My, my greatest fear is that Israel will not follow its own self-interest. My own grave fear is that in the Arab world, you would, not, you would never find a single Arab who would say what Dr. Siegel is saying for the Arabs. I don't recall Dr. Siegel being very, very active in the campaign for Russian jury, and I was, of course. Dr. Siegel became famous for the Arabs, and that's the problem. I'm waiting for Jews to be normal and have self-interest. Well, let's let Dr. Siegel respond, then we'll go to Houston, Texas. Dr. Siegel? Yeah. Um, well, the one thing that's, uh, that's been said here that I do agree with is that, um, that self-interest is the primary determinant of, uh, not the sole determinant, but the primary determinant of uh, the behavior of, of nation states. With respect to the Palestinians and the possibility of a Palestinian state, as I've argued all along, it's not a question of uh, making decisions on the basis of Israel trusting, it's a question of a judgment as to what will Israel's defensive and offensive capabilities be. Israel's a very powerful country, uh, both in conventional terms as well as in nuclear terms. I think from the point of view of the Palestinians, the reason that a two-state solution has got some stability is that for the first time, it gives the Palestinians something vital to lose. And I think that actually this point was made uh, within the Palestinian movement when uh, George Habash years ago was arguing against the idea of accepting a state in the West Bank. He maintained that the inherent logic of accepting a state in the West Bank is that the Palestinians would be driven to give up their objective 
of destroying Israel because once they had that, they'd have to protect it. And the truth of the matter is that once a settlement is made with the Palestinians, if they get their own state in the West Bank and that's used as a basis for renewed attacks on Israel, Israel has the wherewithal, and I have no doubt whatsoever that it would move very rapidly, uh, not just to reoccupy, but under those circumstances, to try to resolve the conflict permanently by expelling the Palestinians from the West Bank and annexing that territory. Uh, it's that fact, which is not lost on the Palestinians, which would be the determining factor on, on Palestinian foreign policy. With respect to one other issue, which is uh, Rabbi Kahana is maintaining that we don't know what the, what the PLO can sign or they're incapable of signing this, there's Hawatma and there's Habash and so on. The truth of the matter is that we will never know until in fact they are in a real negotiating situation with their real adversary, which has been the Israeli government. The only way we're going to find out whether or not negotiations could be fruitful is in fact to begin them. And our thesis is simply that it's enough in Israel's interests and Israel is secure enough and strong enough that it can begin to undertake those negotiations. If in fact the Palestinians uh, re refuse to meet uh, legitimate demands in those negotiations, the Israelis will, uh, will simply not bring them to conclusion. Houston, Texas, go ahead. Hello. I'd like to say something about the deficit that we have and the amount of money that we're uh, contributing to foreign countries. Israel is one of the major countries that gets the most money from our budget. And I'm just wondering, uh, as average Americans, why um, we put up with it as constituents of uh, the... Uh, politicians in this country we're pretty upset with the amounts of money over the years that have gone to Israel and other countries all right thank, thank you. you Rabbi Kahana yes I think that uh, it's about time that uh, you know this that this issue was you know met finally and head-on in our platform we had a plank that called for the ending of US economic aid to Israel what about defensive aid? Wait a while, wait a while. Let's take, let's take one, thing, one thing first. Okay. I don't we're want, running, we've got seven minutes left. Okay. I don't want economic aid in America. It doesn't help Israel. Israel has become an economic junkie. It lives off charity and contributions. A state that is normal does not live off charity. Uh, I want Israel to reform its economy capitalism, free enterprise. There's enough private, private funds which would pour in, into Israel uh, out of the base of, again, of self-interest. People who would make money. As far as military aid, if America thinks that Israel is not worth it, it should not give Israel a penny. If it believes, as it has believed over all these, these years, that it, that it needs a stable, anti-Soviet ally in that, in that region, then let it give the money and let all these other people shut up. Again, it's a question of self-interest. If America feels it is not to its interest, don't give us a penny. If it is, then give us the kinds of uh, money you give to Egypt or the Philippines or Taiwan or in any other country. The question again is self-interest and America has to decide what is good for America. Dr. Siegel? Yeah, I have a somewhat different perspective. Um, actually, I worked um, on the aid program uh, in the U.S. government for a number of years. Um, my own belief is that, is that the large amount of aid that we give to Israel and we also give to Egypt um, basically emerged out of the uh, 73 war between Israel and Egypt and it was basically part of the way in which the U.S. Uh, sweetened the pot and met the uh, demands, in some case economic demands, in some case security demands, of the two parties. But put in crude terms, what the U.S. has done with the money is that it helped to buy peace between Israel and Egypt, and the aid that it provides helps to stabilize that peace. Uh, my own feeling is that it's worked for 10 years, um, 
that uh, relative to many other things that we as Americans might do with our own money, whether it's uh, spending it on our private lives or spending it on other programs, buying peace uh, in, uh, in that part of the world, it seems to me, uh, is, a, is a worthy uh, outcome. And uh, we've, gotten, uh, we've gotten an important part of that piece. And if we can extend it uh, more deeply, I think it would be an expenditure well made. All right. The, Let me interrupt to say that we're, we're no, given the rate we're going, this next call will be the last one we take, and we've got to take it okay. now. And it's from Dallas, Texas. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Uh, Rabbi Kahana, what gives a Jewish guy from the Bronx the right to go to the Palestine and request, and he wanted, stated clearly that he wants to throw the Palestinian out of the West Bank and everywhere so there'll be enough Jews in there to have a majority. What give him that right to be an American citizen, an Israeli citizen, and the Palestinians have no place to be a citizen of? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's get things clear here now. Really, what you're really asking is what rights did Jews have to come and found any kind of a Jewish state, period, not just, not just the West Bank. That's your question, really. And uh, obviously, I understand that. You, you are opposed to a Jewish state, period. You think that it is, that it is Palestine, that there is no difference between, between Jaffa and uh, 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 Hebron. You think that Haifa is also yours. I understand that. The reason that Jews have right to be there is because it's our country. I'm a Bible believer. God gave us that country. And Jews have lived there for 4,000 years. Long before there were Arabs, there was a Jewish state. It was ended by Babylon. And then the Jews came back again and founded a second state. And that was ended by the, uh, by the uh, Romans. Not one day passed during the 1900 years of Jewish exile in which we didn't pray three times a day to Jerusalem and not to Mecca to go back to Zion. That's why it's our land, and that's why it's our country, and that's why it's our state. But I understand you, and I think that Dr. Siegel doesn't. Let me say we've got one minute left, okay. and given the way things are going, why don't you take half a minute just to well, sum up your position? I want to respond. To the, if you do, then that's all the time you're going to have. Okay, so well, you've got half a minute to speak right. generally. Actually, or I think we just got to, the, got, got to the core difference, which is really, it has to do with moral ambiguity. Um, our basic view is that the Jewish people did have a right to establish a Jewish state in the Middle East, but at the same time, while we had the right to do that, there's no doubt that the establishment of that state did involve uh, things that were unfair and unjust to the Palestinian population that was there. Our belief is that uh, sometimes there are situations in the world which can be justified even if they involve unfairness, but there are limits. And one of the limits it has been reached, that is with the current existence of, an, of a Jewish state, there is no right of Jews to go further as Rabbi Kahana would propose and, and in fact kick out the remaining Palestinians. Rabbi what we have to do is try to minimize injustice, not maximize it. I think that the tragedy is that when Arabs who stand firmly and say it's our land are faced with a Dr. Siegel who says, well, it's true, we had a right, but we did the wrong thing. Any objective person listening to Dr. Siegel and an Arab would say the Arab is right. Well, Dr. Siegel is wrong and the Arab is wrong. We have a right to be there. We did nothing wrong. We came back to our, to our land and found people who had occupied our, our land. There are 22 Arab countries. God bless them all. Let the Arabs who live in inside Israel live with their brothers and their sisters. Thank you, Rabbi Kahana, and also Dr. Siegel. We appreciate your time this evening. And thanks to our audience for watching. Have a good evening. That concludes this live viewer call-in program focusing on Israeli foreign policy. We invite you to join us on Wednesday, February the 7th, that's at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific Time, when our guest on another live you will call in program will be Dave Beckwith. He serves as press secretary for Vice President Dan Quayle. That's a live you will call in program with Vice President Quayle's press secretary, Wednesday, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific Time. Coming up next, we break for a look at the schedule, then bring you a hearing held to look at the defense budget.
Good evening from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. We'll take a short break now to update our programming schedule for the next several hours. And we invite you to join us on Wednesday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time for a live viewer call-in program with David Beckwith. He's Vice President Dan Quayle's press secretary and will be on hand to take your comments and questions. Coming up in just a moment, a hearing in the Senate Budget Committee focusing on the administration's proposed defense budget for fiscal year 1991. That's followed by a speech given by Owen Bieber, president of the United Auto Workers. He addressed the UAW's legislative conference on Sunday. At 12.40 a.m. Eastern Time, you'll hear remarks by President Bush before the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Then we turn to a hearing on the proposed cut in the Social Security payroll tax. The hearing took place today in the Senate Finance Committee. At four